class. Welcome to the Archetype Pattern Workshop. This is a school, and it is not a church. And neither we affiliated with a church or religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non-denominational, religious, and scientific research organization dedicated to proving the existence of Yahweh or Elohim and the operation of the eternal pattern, purpose, and plan operating throughout eternity unto this present day. Now, this school is a result of the divine vision and revelation given to Dr. Dr. Harrison McKinley in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. It has been incorporated throughout the United States and Canada and certain other foreign countries. Archetype Pattern Workshop established of February. February of 2021. Now, in this school, we use and teach by the true and the original names and titles for the Father, the Word, or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name for the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been a proper is Elohim. It has also been properly substituted by God. And the true name for the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God. They are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul filled with the Holy Spirit tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 their Lord's name and God's name. We now know that each Lord must have a name, and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. This means Elohim is a title that our Creator chose for Himself. Jesus is a name, but Jesus is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that the Hebrew language, the Greek language, or the Latin language have any characters or letters in the alphabet that would produce the sound made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings for the true and original name of our Heavenly Father and His Son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state, He's incomprehensible, inscrutable, and indiscernible. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh symbolized in his pure spirit state on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose the cloud to symbolize himself because the cloud is no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the Word or Son, a super incorporeal being that is having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. Now this shape and form can only be seen in a divine vision and understood in a divine revelation. Later on, the self same spirit manifests himself in a physical body and walked on the earth plate as Yahshua, the Messiah, who the world calls Jesus Christ. There's only one name given them salvation, and we all must know this name. So the simple yet intelligent question we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time that he walked the earth plane? A further 
understanding of this theme and title could be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also in this book, we teach about the divine pattern of the universe. It is called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, he called Moses on top of Mount Sinai and showed him a tabernacle pattern in a vision. And he instructed Moses to build an exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. This pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court round about. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. And we go forth to the school to prove that everything in the universe operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes this pattern. Now the ten aims of the school are as follows. One is to help you find and know Yahweh or Elohim as he really is and as he actually exists. Two is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah. Without the distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law, the so-called law of nature, and the powers latent in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth is to extirpate current superstitions, skepticism, and ignorance. Six to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensation and ages. Seventh is to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the devil, the serpent, or Satan, and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensation of time. And the ages to earnestly contend for the common salvation of faith that was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. And night is to make known that Yahweh, from the beginning ordained, there is no other name given among men whereby man must be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And ten is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the newer state. Our watcher is peace. In our slogan, speak the truth. Okay, this morning we have a prayer by Dr. Kenway Kleinsmith. Our scripture lesson is 2 Peter, the third chapter. Our scripture will be Dr. Reed Ramirez. And we have a selection of music after the prayer. I'm a newbie. I had to learn how to use a microphone. Anyway, I'm glad to be here today. I'm glad that I'm able to come to class some of the time and learn, learn more about the rest of the side. And it's been a while since I've been here, but I really need to be fed, as all of us do. And I want to thank Yahshua for allowing me to be here. Let's say praise Yahweh. Yahweh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Thank you.
and I've been reading 2 Peter, the third chapter. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by the way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which we spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles, of the Redeemer and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scopers walking after their own lust, and saying, Where is this promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of Yahweh of the heavens, or of the old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, or by the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto the fire against the day of judgment and perdition of wicked men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with Yahweh as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Yahweh is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but this long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of Yahweh will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with great noise, and the elements shall melt with, melt with fervent heat, and earth, I mean, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought ye to be in all holy conduct and righteousness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of Yahweh, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with perfect heat. Nevertheless, we according to his promise, look for the new heavens and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless, and account, an account that the long suffering of our Savior is salvation, even as our beloved brother Saul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, had written unto you, as also in all the epistles speaking up in them of these things, in which some things are to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also in the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also be led away with the error of the wicked, fall from our own steadfastness, but grow in peace, grow in grace, and in the knowledge of the, our Redeemer and Savior, Yahshua Messiah, to him be glory both now and ever. Let us all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, thank you for that. Okay, uh, bear with us. I'm working on the sound system a little bit to make it more clear so you can hear it. Uh, also, uh, thank you for joining us this, this morning. Okay, uh, I'll probably make a couple of announcements after class about uh, these uh, chart books. I have probably the name of those things. So. But yeah, it's all the charts that uh, uh, we're going to be uh, getting from the people out there that want them. Okay? And uh, uh, that should be it uh, for our first speaker. It will be Dr. Will Williams.
good to be here. Good to see you all as always. To learn more of this great and awesome, stupendous, colossal, panoramic vision of revelation that you see here tonight. Given by Yahweh Elohim to one who could have killed it. What's that name? I trust God. Um, I have no particular topic, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to get to say. Because, see, I, got, I can turn around and just, you know, I mean, this is virtually a sports board up here. We can really stop and think about it. Okay. Can't hear you that good. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's not on. That, that's what I was asking. But <laughs> <laughs> you can hear me. But I'm going to let you guys, you know, if you want, if you got something you want to, you 
know, inquire about or it's something, you know, I mean, this is a school. This is not a church, you know, let's emphasize that. And we're not a church because when we file for a nonprofit religious organization status, I, I made it specifically clear to these people that we are not a church. And they said, yeah, we understand it. Because if you were a church, then you would have to go through this particular type of procedure. And I'm like, fine. Yeah. As long as we understand that. Okay, because you know we're we're a nonprofit religious organization, but we're not a church. We are a school, okay, but we're registered in the state of California. As of now, we're fighting for federal tax exempt status, okay? All right, just so that we can have a platform, you know, without leaving anybody else telling us otherwise, that we can come here and we can preach this gospel. That's the whole idea, okay? Uh, anybody? Yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, give me the microphone. Yeah, we want to hear you, little girl. Okay. Um, I've been reading about spirit law. About what? Spirit law. Yes. Can we um, touch on that? Because I think I'm starting to understand a little more. Um, spirit law. Okay. You want to? Okay. Give, give me a little. Give me something a little more specific. In other words, uh, I'll, I'll bring it to you the way Dr. Kelly did. Uh, ask the ask your question, ask it like you really want to know. In other words, you say you want to know about spirit law. What is it about spirit law that you are in doubt? Of, I mean, uh, I, I'm not going to put it that you that you inquiring about. Um, examples, examples, Ex like more examples of spirit law. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you know of any examples yourself? Yes, about I mean, just what I read in the the Ellen book about um, the birds flying. Okay. All right. That, that gives you something to go with. Okay, all right. Um, hmm. <laughs> you know, I did this recently for a, a Zoom class a couple, a couple of weeks ago, a lady, uh, friend of mine out in Detroit. And we kind of went into it. It, it took, and, we, and we've gone through it before. It, took, it literally took three sessions to go through the whole gamut of what's in the textbook, particularly the, the uh, comparative exegesis. Let's just get the textbook. And then we'll, we'll go from there. Because <clears throat> you see, and a lot of people don't realize this. You know, I went over it I know, a few weeks ago, but we talk about Henry Clifford Kennedy as a doctor, and he has a PhD. Why does he have a PhD? The reason why he has a PhD is because of his explanation of spirit law as he explained it in comparative comparative exegetical analysis. Now, when you go into the textbook, before you get that section, you need to look at the section prior to that, see, to get an idea of what's, what's going on here. And that would be page, um, that would be page uh, 48, you see, which is called The Basic Teaching of the New Psychology. And uh, why don't we just read that? This is, I mean, we are a workshop, so let's just let's just read that that section. Start there. Yes, the, yes, the basic teaching of the new psychology, page forty-eight. Author's note: We will use the title "God" through this article for understanding and clarity of explanation. For what I am able to understand, many of these modern academically trained famous. Psychologists have already gone on record believing and teaching that God is a threefold mind. They do not all call the major part of the great mind by the same name. It is also true that they do not all agree on a few minor details involved in the, in the ramified function of this great mind. But on the main issues at hand, they all they are well agreed. Some of their presumptions are as follows. One, there is presumed to be a conscious mind in existence. It is supposed to operate through the senses, sight, taste, touch, smell, hearing, etc. The conscious mind is referred to as the vibratory or creative thought chamber of the physical body where ideas are formed. Hence, all voluntary functions of our physical bodies and everything else connected with our material existence is said to be under the direct control of the conscious mind. 
This means that our homes, our business, and all other conscious functions of our bodies are controlled or conducted by the conscious mind. There are other functions attributed to the conscious mind, but neither time or space will permit us to discuss them here. Two, there is also presumed to be a subconscious mind in existence. The subconscious mind and the conscious mind are said to be joined together. The subconscious mind has no conscience. Therefore, it is claimed that the subconscious mind is not a respecter of persons. We are also informed that the great subconscious mind is far more ethereal and powerful in the voluntary bodily functions such as breathing, heartbeat, and the digestion and assimilation of food, the building of new cells for reparation of the physical body and restoring of mentality, of mentally, mentality which has been impaired by illness or injury. The subconscious mind is presumed to be the source of great wisdom and power, for we are told that there is nothing that it cannot or will not do. Once its wisdom and power has been invoked, it receives ideas which are sent down to it by the conscious mind. We are informed that, that once the idea registered in the subconscious mind, it will leave no stone unturned until it is claimed that many cases of diseases there heretofore pronounced are incurable by medical science Let's see. have been miraculously healed. We are told that the, the lame have been made to walk and sight, sight restored to the blind. The new discoveries of scientists and inventors, the successful career of professional and business persons the rising of rank of the ordinary people and the accumulation of wealth in abundance and supreme happiness. All is said to be the materialization of ideas impressed upon the great subconscious mind. Three, still, still deeper down there is presumed to be a universal mind in existence. The universal mind and the subconscious mind are said to be joined together Instead of referring to this mind as the universal mind, some of the psychologists call it the great oversoul, cosmic consciousness, super consciousness, supersonic mind, subliminal mind, infinite mind, etc. In fact, in fact, there are over 170 different scientific and professional names that have been applied to the major operation part of this great mind. Nevertheless, the name universal mind is very popular and quite frequently used by many of the modern psychologists. It is supposed to be the great mastermind of the universe that embraces and sustains all life, whether it be vegetable, animal, human, or otherwise. In fact, ton of the great that ton, ton of the great universal mind. Moreover, it is said to be infinite in intelligence, wisdom, and power. Therefore, it is from the universal mind that the great, that the subconscious mind draws or receives its wisdom and power. Further, we are told that it is within itself far more ethereal and powerful in, in the function and operation than the subconscious mind. Whereas, the multifarious ramification of the great universal mind are far too complicated to even attempt to fully explain herein. Yeah, that's uh, I'm going to give you a pause right there. Okay. Now, Dr. Kendall is uh, is making a point counterpoint argument. For him to make the counterpoint argument, he has to make the point of what these folks are saying, what he calls the basic teaching of the new psychology. I'm willing to surmise that when Dr. Kelly came to California from Ohio, he left, he had 70 people that came with him. This was in 1958. When they came here to California, California 
was the center of this new psychology religion. That is to say, the new psychology that uh, is a, that has been infused in religion. See, what they call, uh, back in my day, I would use the positive male attitude. All right? And there were very some, some notable people that, uh, that wrote books about this. The most notable one uh, was this guy. His name was his name was Ernest Holmes, right? and he wrote a book. And the name of the book was called Science of Mind. Now, when you do do research on Mr. Holmes, his premise was that, and he's a religious guy, his premise was that the mind had the power to invoke what we just read about, the, the, the way psych, because see, the father of psychoanalysis, the first you saw, you know, Sam was Sigmund Freud, and he came up with terms like id, ego, subego, conscious, subconscious, universal, that kind of thing. So, and so this guy took this to another level in this sense by saying that within the man, since you're, you have a mind, a conscious mind, your conscious mind can, through your subconscious, impress upon the great universal mind to bestow things to you. In other words, he said, I need a new car. So, you know, you, through certain types of meditation and thinking, you can impress your conscious thoughts through your subconscious. You go to sleep and your subconscious takes over, and then somehow it, it makes an appeal to the great universal mind. And the universal mind said, oh, okay, but we'll create the conditions by which you can get your, your car or whatever it is that you desire, okay? Now that's, and, 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 and it still permeates today because people say it you know, in ways that people really don't realize how much they reflect this. Like prayer changes things. People say that, that kind of mentality. All you gotta do is pray and it'll happen. See, it's like, no, see, and, and really, we're going to get into it, but it, but it really goes back to an ancient way of thinking, and that, and that would be this. This is, uh, 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 what is yeah. Pantheism. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, I took a religious class many years ago, back in Illinois, part of college, I think, in Illinois. And I took it, and this guy was really good. He was, I mean, it was the world's great religions as you got the chance to study. All the, you know, the tenets, the origins, and that kind of thing. And we got into this kind of thing, pantheism. And the way they explained it to me was simply this. And you usually find it amongst mostly aboriginal peoples. You know, because they would, they would say this. They would say this, the spirit of the of uh, the sun, the spirit of the moon, the spirit of the, the star, the spirit of the bear, the spirit of the coyote, the spirit of the rivers, the spirit of the lakes, the, and a man has a spirit too. So all of these spirits control these things. What? Can you explain the, the aboriginal? Aboriginal, the, what, what we would call primitive peoples. People who were there and they have a, a, this a pantheistic view of the world, you know, like, uh, and, and they would and see, and do this, you have to have, you have, you, you have rituals. In pantheism, you have rituals. And the reason why you have ritual, rituals is to create magic. Now, when we say magic, we're not talking about Ken and Tell, though I have seen this show, and they're pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, but, but what they do is not magic. It's sleight of hand. It's misdirection. Magic here, see, involves the com it involves the coming together of spirits or souls. In this case, men. The souls of men 
creating magic through rituals to influence other spirits. Say the spirit of the rain cloud, say, or the spirit of the buffalo, or the spirit of the bear, or, you know, to influence that. Because see, look, see in ancient times, see, in ancient, you know, I mean, with these peoples, the Aboriginal peoples, they do, they do, uh, like I said, these certain rituals. But the one I always use, you know, is the rain dance, right? You got, you got these folks here. souls too. And I'm not just putting three of it, but it could be the whole tribe. Everybody's involved. And they're dancing and they're doing a ritual, they're chanting. They may even have something to help them along, like, you know, maybe some psychoactive drug, you know, peyote or, drink, or something that will enhance their mind or get them into a state of frenzy so that they, you know, they become one. Their souls become one. I think we went through this. It's this word here. Child, can I spell that? Huh? That's right. Yeah, it's stop. See, that's what that is. Let's look it up. See, and so these 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 people are doing a ritual and they're creating magic here. And this magic is going to go out and appeal to the rain cloud. And basically, it's, it's just a simple message. Say rain. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much what this is. Bring us rain, or bring us the buffalo, or whatever it is. Do we have this now? Something that is made of many parts, yet is somehow more than or different from the combination of its parts. That's it. Anybody got anything else? An organized whole that is perceived as more than the sum of its parts. Okay. More, that's what's happening here. See, because the whole tribe is doing this. Send a message to the rain, to the rain, to the spirit of the rain cloud. Send rain. And the rain and the spirit of the rain cloud can answer any way they want. You know, yes, no, maybe, or whatever. See? But that's the idea. That's the whole, that is the idea of a prayer among these people. And, and this type of concept has come down through thousands of years to today. This is what Dr. Kennedy is suggesting in the new psych, the basic teaching of the new psychology of religion. He didn't mention it in there, but he did mention it in, text, in the transcripts about, about the pantheistic notion and the concept of the pantheism bringing on down to the modern into all that is infused in many of these different religions, that concept, okay? Now, the world doesn't run like this. It just doesn't, you know? A farmer does not, you know, stand in the middle of, stand at the edge of his fields and just, you know, just say, okay, grow. Whatever it is out there, corn, you know, whatever he's got, go, grow. It just doesn't work. What is he going to have to do? Well, he, he's just coming there, you know, there's just land that he's going to have to want to maybe clear the land, it may have some rocks on there, pull up some stumps, see? Then he's going to have to furrow the land, see? Furrow it. If it's kind of dry, he's going to have to come up with an irrigation thing, you know, plant the seeds, come up with an irrigation process. And then he's going to sit back and maybe add some fertilizer, you know, some cow manure or whatever. And then he's going to expect the sun to rise the next day to shine. And he's going to check it every day. He's going to put a scarecrow out in the middle there to keep the birds away. You know, he's going to look at the field. If any weeds is coming up, he's going to go out there and pull it. That's what a farmer's going to have to do. He's not, he ain't dependent on this. He's dependent on the sun. He's depending on the conditions that he's got to create for the sun to do its job to make the plants grow. The plants, he could have just thrown them out there and not doing anything, and they're gonna grow anyway. Some will make it, some may not. Right. But as a farmer, 
he is his job to make sure all of them make it by doing certain things that will ensure the best possible yield for whatever it is he's growing. See? And he's not trying to do that now. Maybe now, of course, that doesn't mean a farmer. It's a religion. Some farmer may pray to the old Lord, please give me a good crop this year. You know, he may do that. Sure. And even they did that. But they had enough sense. But especially when people began to, to, to move away from hunter-gatherer type stuff right. to domestic type of stuff, then they had to begin to learn about the land. You know, and the conditions, you know, domesticating the, not just the land, but the animals, connecting this kind of thing, what they like to do, and that, you know. I mean, man, human beings are very observant people, you know. Folks, you know, you'd be surprised, you know, on some of the stuff these ancient people come up with, you know. I mean, we, we think we, we brought these people, man, they, they were closer to the earth. They knew what was going on, like, you know, certain, you know, plants and this kind of thing. You know, I was watching something the other day, and it's got nothing to do with it, but about the, the, the Romans. They were talking about medicine, and they had, and they were showing surgical instruments that the Romans had 2,000 years ago, and they laid them side by side with modern day surgical instruments. You know, and you could hardly tell them apart. They were the same. But anyway, but to, your, to what you're talking about, our spirit law. See, this is, this is the, the point Dr. Kinley is making at first when we read that in the textbook about what people, about the new psychology and how it's really permeated throughout all the major religions. All right? And I remember, I, I used to be into this a little bit myself because I used to be a, a teenage hypnotist. And I learned, and, and, and when, you learn a hip, when you learn hypnosis, they teach you according to conscious, subconscious, and unconscious. Even the process hypnosis is a threefold process. Because first you have to get someone to a light state of sleep. Then you have to get into a medium state. Then there's a deep state of sleep. And at different states, you can do different things with your body. You know, like in a light state, you can do what I used to call part of the You know, like you can tell somebody to stretch his arm out and say that you can't feel any pain and you stick it with a needle. See, and it doesn't feel it because what has happened is because when a person is under hypnosis, they have channeled their consciousness in such a narrow little path that they only see you and trust you implicitly. You can literally tell somebody that it's raining on them and they'll believe it, or that it's, it's hot, you know, it's 100, uh, 110 degrees when it's 32 degrees outside. See, because they implicitly believe what you say. In other words, by putting your consciousness in such a narrow, tight band, you open yourself up to what I call super suggestibility, which is what hypnosis really is. It's more, it's a more refined act of that. Suggestibility is happens all the time. It happens between people when we communicate with each other. We try to get a friend to do something or a husband trying to get a wife to do something or vice versa, or commercials that happen, you know, that kind of thing. Now, what they, what they used to do it back in the day with the 16 millimeter films, you know, go to the drive-in, and they would slip in, you know, a hamburger, and what the frame, because see, the frames, the move is 16 frames per second, and then, then you take one frame out of the 16 and put a hamburger in there, it goes so fast, you really don't, you don't consciously see it, but your eye sees it and it's recorded in your brain. And then next thing you know, like 10 minutes later, you know, you'd be like, damn, yeah, well, I should feel like I'm, I feel like eating a hamburger. <laughs> you know? That kind of, but that's what they used to do. Because your, your body is an information magnet. See? So it's like, I see, I see all of y'all right now. And I remember all of you know, because that's my focus. But if I was to have to go back and hypnosis, I could go back and remember, oh, well, you know, the speaker's over here, and this the forty plates over here, and this is happening up here. You know, you can get into detail, whereas me, I'm not even paying attention. I'm just paying attention to the main things that I need to deal with. But your body is recording it. See, every time the wind blows, you know, your, your body is, you know, you know, I'm talking about your senses, taste, touch, hearing, seeing, you know, feeling, all of it, it's, it's all recorded. And it has to be processed and downloaded in your brain every time sleep. It's part of the reason why we sleep. So that all the information that we have accumulated during the waking hours can be processed while we're sleeping. 
and you know, which is more important? Well, this you got to do this, this deal, that you know, that wasn't going to throw that out. You don't need, you know, that kind of thing. It makes those kind of decisions. But my point over here: conscious, subconscious, and, and uh, universal. Well, they used to call it, say unconscious. See, the fallacy in it, the way Dr. Killings explaining it is, well, we're going to read it. Go back to the textbook. And, and read page 49, it says, failure of the modern new psychological religions. Failure of the modern new psychological religions. This modern psychologist, psychologists have gone a long way up the road through their investigations of the um, psychical realm. They have come close to finding the eternal living creator. However, they have made three great mistakes that have impede, impeded the process. One, their failure to use the divine given pattern. Two, that of leaving the biblical my, 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 messianic, messianic uh, definition of God, Elohim, the Spirit, in the background, and three, believing and teaching that there is a universal mind instead of a universal spirit. All right. Now, that's what, now, that's mm -hmm. the point Dr. Kelly sets up. First, he said, first he's got to explain what is the new psychology, what's the basis of the new right. psychology. So, you know, because if he's going to, Go against something, then he's got to explain, okay, what is it that you are going against? And this is what he's doing here. He's explaining, he's making his point. All right. This is the failure. The, this is well, first, this is what this is the basis of the new psychology. And then he says, this is the failure of it. See, because one, they don't realize that one Yahweh is spirit. Right. He's a universal spirit, not a universal mind. See. And that there's a pattern, a universal pattern involved that has a universal spirit law embedded therein. See, and, and basically, Dr. Kelly just made it real simple. He just said, look, mind is subject to change. Mm -hmm. And when it does change, it's either going to go in either one or two directions, either for better or for worse. OK? Because it's subject to that. And, and, and really, this is where we talk about the carnal mind. Mm -hmm. See, that is to say, prone toward things of the flesh or the physical. That's subject to change, whereas the spirit does not. Right. See, spirit law, for example, you, know, you mentioned uh, about the birds. You know, the, the birds don't have to ask anybody. They say, okay, hey, it's time to fly south. If that's what they normally do. There are some birds that are northern, you know, where the birds, but. A bird knows, let's say, hey, it's time to head south. Why? Because the seasons are changing. All right? And I'm not going to survive here, so I'm, home, so I'm heading south, okay? That's what they do. See, no one has to tell them that. See, it's something they know that is inbred in them, and that's the spirit of law. Right. They're do that. It's not like a bird is going to say, well, you know, I think I'll change my mind, and I'll stick around this way, you know? They can do that. I mean, if they were to do that, then they'll freeze. See, if they're not migratory. There are some birds that are winter birds that don't go nowhere, or it will come up north, because it's, you know, for that. But basically, birds fly south for the winter. That's just what they do. Just like the seasons come around. Fall, winter, spring, summer. Then it repeats itself. Okay. All right. So now, a man just doesn't have anything to do with that. Right. You know. Now, grant you, the man is. I mean, compared to the rest of the animals, you can say this about man. The animals adapt themselves to the environment, whereas man, for the most part, will try to adapt the environment to him. See, that's why we can build. Las Vegas out in the middle of the desert, something like that. See, and animals see animals. Look, let's read it because it was quoted in the 
John 4.24. Spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. All right. Yahweh is spirit. So, you know, we know in most, we always say, in most Bibles we say, God is a spirit. So, we try to infer that there's one kind of spirit, and then, you know, Yahweh is another kind. Of the humble point we're making is, Yahweh is spirit. He is the source and substance of all that exists. He is these attributes. Right? Wisdom tells us knowledge, love, beauty, justice, bondage, and power, and strength. Matter is spirit materialized. Okay? So that means this, that when you look at everything, you're looking at a manifestation of wisdom, intelligence, knowledge, love, beauty, justice, bondage, and power, and strength. Okay? For me, one good way to see that. is this. I know there's sick looking mountains, but and this is the ocean. Okay. I have to I don't know if that was so I don't know if that Okay. Here's the sun. Now the sun heats up the ocean. The earth is 75, 70, 75 percent water. And right. most of that water is salt water that we cannot drink. However, Yahweh has a process. See, this process is called The hydrological cycle. And this happens every second as we speak. See? And it has to go through, it has to be continuous because if, it's, if it should stop at any time, life as right. we know it would end on this planet. What do you mean? Well, here it is. The sun heats up the water. That causes Evaporation. Right. Right? And then they become clouds. All right? And then when it gets high enough, it gets, because when it goes up high, it gets cooler. When it cools, and then, then you have rain, which is condensation. And that, and that makes the rivers, the lakes, and the streams. And they go back into, eventually, get back into the ocean. But the salt, but see, this is salt water. When, it's, when the water is evaporated, it's just the H2O that goes up from the salt that's left behind. So when the rain comes down, that's fresh water. This is a process by which Yahweh can feed his, his creature. Right. See? And when you really understand this process, it's really all the attributes in play. Because it takes wisdom, intelligence, and knowledge to come up with a system like this. See, it takes it takes the uh, and Yahweh did it out of love, because we can't drink salt water. Right. So Yahweh, out of love, created this process by which we get fresh water. See, and it's true justice because when it rains, it rains on everything: the plants, the man, and the animals. See, Yahweh's not shirking nobody's a year. This is for all. See? And it takes the power of the sun to pull these molecules up. And this is the foundation, this ideological cycle is the foundation of the ecosystem on this planet. See? And it takes the strength and power of the sun to, to make this thing happen, to pull these molecules up and make it, you know, you see, you, and that's the spirit of law. And I bring, the sun, as you in, controls the weather. Right. That's a physical manifestation of the spirit of law. Not only does it, it controls the weather on this planet, it controls the whole solar system because these nine planets revolve around it. 
See, that's the big, it's showing you how spirit law is in operation, and nobody can. See, you can't stand up at sunrise and, and mentally say, and mentally in your power say, son, don't run. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Not that you know, it appears that way, because we know if you look at the science, it's the earth that goes around the sun. Okay? And really, <laughs> to be honest with you, when you do see a sunrise in the morning, you are eight minutes late. <laughs> because the light that you see, see look, the sun is 93 million miles from the earth. And see, and light travels at 186,000 miles per second. See, so literally it takes, if you were to turn the light, the sun off like a light switch and turn it back on, it would take eight minutes for, for that sunlight to reach you. So when you do say, oh, there's a sunrise, oh, you're you eight minutes late. <laughs> Go back there, you see? But you can't, but you don't have nothing to say with that, about that. See, you can't sit up and pray, oh, I want the sun to rise in the west instead of the east. <laughs> you know, you, you, you just can't. So when somebody says, well, prayer changes things, well, 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 try to pray that. Try to pray pray and change that, see, see how far that will get. Back in the old days, they used to tell us when you pray, all you're doing is creating brown spots on the ceiling. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they used to tell us. <laughs> but there's a spirit law in operation, see, all right? And it's, it is, it is, let's, let's go. Romans uh, 1, 19, 20. Romans 1, 19 and 20. Because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them. For Yahweh has shown it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by things that are made, even his eternal power and supernal nature, so that they are without excuse. All right, so now let's go back. We'll take the supernal nature. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, these three are one, okay? And there are three that bear witness, you know, in the earth, the Spirit, the Water, and the Blood, and these three are three in one. Right. So he's given to the Spirit. Now his eternal power, that is the power of transmutation. Right. Because that is what Yahweh does eternally. That's how this creation came into being, by transmutation. When when Elohim took on a shape, we always say he took on a shape and form. Well, what, what does that mean? That means he, this was a transmutation. Mm -hmm. Pure spirit transmuted in part into this shape and form, which is known as the word. These attributes assembled together in part, not in totality, to make this super incorporeal man, or what we call the great heavenly, anthropomorphic being. It came about by transmutation. Likewise, this creation comes about by transmutation. That's why here, you see here these lips, I see these thunderbolts are speaking the law. This law is the same as Elohim. This is the law of the spirit manifested in a superincorporeal state. Then the scripture says that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. This is spirit law manifested in the flesh. A good example of that. Matthew, I think it's 820, 824, 26, somewhere around there. It's the eighth chapter. Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? 
Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Okay. Now, why did they obey him? Because they recognized who he was. He was there at their inception. In other words, he created them. So when he says, cease and desist, they were like, oh, okay. We know who you are. <laughs> you are the law of the spirit. See, made manifested in the flesh. That's why he was able to do the things he did. See, okay? Now, yes, yes, give me my microphone. Um, so we have Yahweh the Spirit on the chart, and then we have Yahshua, who is the Holy Spirit. Why is there a distinction between the Holy Spirit and Spirit, since there is only one Spirit? Okay, good question. And sometimes that that that, that confuses people because people because we say it in the moderation, you know, that this is Yahshua, this is the Holy Spirit, you know, in or out of the body. Right. But I have you not know, see. Yahweh is the Holy Spirit, because these three are one. But now, boy, this is a good question. Because, see, it goes into the thing about what is the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit is simply the conscious recognition of that spirit law in you. Go to the Ains, the third Ains. Read the third Ains. See, and no, you know, these Ains, we, we adopt these Ains, too, even though they're, they're idea mark, but we're not idea mark, but we have adopted these things. Okay, the third aim. To investigate the unexplained spirit law, or so-called law of nature, and the powers latent in man. Okay, see, the powers latent in man, and, and see, some people might think, oh, well, the Holy Spirit is latent in me. That is not so. Here's what I tell you, and this is based on the teaching that this founder, you know, Dr. Kennedy brought about. The Holy Spirit and the law of the Spirit are one and the same. The only difference is you. Because it said the power latent in man. See, the power that's latent in man is simply you not knowing who you are. Right. That's the power latent in you. See? And that is the spirit law. That's why here, look here. You see this veil here? It's, it's ragged. Why? Because it's torn out. It's letting you know that prior to that, when that veil was up, see, spirit law rules and, and is running things, but you didn't know that. But then once that veil is ripped between, then you recognize, oh, what that spirit law is. It's really Joshua, which is the Holy Spirit, which is going to teach you all these things. But they're both one and the same. There's no such thing as a fourth state of spirit. And this is where people get confused a lot of times. And, and the reason why is because they don't use the pattern. They don't use the charts in their explanation of these things. And there's a lot of things I could probably jump off into that, that would probably be controversial in, in this sense of explaining how the Holy Spirit and spirit law operates. And then you got this thing here called the mystery of iniquity. Right. See, that's the factor involved here too. And see, if people get into the thing about, because it says in the scriptures about spirits, plural, Right. You know, that kind of thing. And that's because of the transmitter. But when you really stop and understand it, that's why we, we, we show you that we come up with terms like incorporeal. See? Because angels are incorporeal. So are demons. They're incorporeal too. Guess what? So is your soul. Right. That's incorporeal. It's the same way. Your thoughts are incorporeal. When you go to sleep at night and dream, whatever it is you dream about, your dream is incorporeal. It's not physical, it's, it's incorporeal. So it's, it's the same wavelength. The difference is, it's a veil. Right. It's a veil. See, that's what, and see, and that's the thing about, uh, That's the thing about the uh, about the conscious, subconscious, and universal. Here's what Dr. Kennedy said about that. Because they said, we read that, uh, and this, and, and, and I've been through, 
I, I just I used to dabble in hypnosis. I even went to a professional and tried to become one, you know, because you can make some money. You know, being a hypnotist, you know, you get like a hundred people in a room charge of forty dollars a pop and you know, do a mass hypnosis like that and then a couple hour sessions there, that's that's some good money, man. You know, you know, you wear a suit and you know, just be on the microphone and it hires two hundred people in an auditorium and I say they pay me forty dollars and you know, that's yeah, it's good work you can get. This is what they told me. We use this. All right. They said that we only use a small percent of our conscious mind. This part here is the subconscious. And then all this white area here would be the universal. You know, because it's vast. Okay? Now, Dr. Kinley would simply say this. How do you know to put this line here as a, as a, as a separation between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind? That's what he would ask. How do you know? How do you know you should put it there? Why not somewhere else? Why, you know, how do you, and that's the thing that they don't know. See, they don't know where the conscious mind ends and the subconscious mind begins. That's a, that's a problem, okay? Here's what Dr. Kennedy said. Go back to the textbook. Page, uh, page 50, and you get at the top. Comparative exegetical analysis. Mind is most frequently associated with the mental state of a human being, according to reputable lexicographers. Therefore, mind is constantly subject to fluctuating changes, for better or worse, but not so in the case of God or spirit. As he said, for I am Yahweh, I change not. Dr. Hugo Munsterberg, the former Dean of Psychology at Harvard University, made the statement that there is no such thing as a subconscious mind in existence. Here and now, I make the unconditional statement that Yahweh is not a subconscious or universal mind. Instead, Yahweh is all in all. That is to say, Yahweh is the eternal, threefold, universal spirit, possessing the power of transmutation in his two manifestations, incorporeal and physical. But in the absence of a clear, understandable definition and explanation of what spirit really is and how it operates, we are still compelled to remain in ignorance or jeopardy. In the pure, literal sense of the word, spirit is abstract, but in the true divine <clears throat> etymology, concrete sense, spirit is the all in all, or the terminus ad quam, of whom a direct, and profound knowledge is not claimed. The expression terminus ad quem refers to Yahweh in his abstract state or without form, being the limit and bounds of every conceivable and inconceivable idea of source and substance, wisdom and intelligence, knowledge and power, law and justice, love and mercy, beauty and glory. In the abstract sense, absolutely nothing could exist before or independent of spirit. Neither can anything with or without shape or form be pre-existent or co-eternal with spirit. Therefore, as we have already said, Yahweh is this state of existence, is pure spirit or abstraction. 
but Yahweh in the process of taking a form or moving in part from the abstract into intermediate state conceived the idea of the concrete creation and the desire to manifest or make himself known to his creatures of the creation. Now, as Yahweh Elohim existed in form before he began his work of creation, he is therefore the true threefold archety archetypal spirit pattern of the universe. Okay, all right, hold it right there. We get Malachi 3, 6. Let's read that. <clears throat> change not. Therefore, these sons of Jacob are not consumed. All right. Now, I am Yahweh, and I change not. Right. See? And listen, a lot of people think he's changing into this Elohim's decision form. He ain't changing into that, because he was already that right. in the first place. And that's hard for a lot of people to understand that, see, because People tend to think, oh, well, he created the sun, but he's changing into that. Yahweh is not changing into anything. Right. We just read it. I change not. See, why? Because in an abstract state, Yahweh is all in all. It all exists there. If you can conceive it, it exists here. And that's because he's the all in all. We just read it. He's the terminus our quim. That's Latin for the limits and bounds. Right. And everything that, that you can think of that can exist, that's what he is already. That's the way Dr. Kennedy explained it. See, because he's not changing into the sun, moon, and stars, and all of that. He was already that in the first place, but in an abstract state. But you can't perceive the sun, moon, and stars in an abstract state. Therefore, he has to make it manifest. But it already was here. He's already that. Otherwise, he wouldn't be all in all. And he does not change. He's not changing. He's just making manifest that which you, which you can't perceive. He's not changing it to the sun. He's just making it manifest. It's already there. Right. So that's what he is, all in all. But you can't. Dr. Kennedy said it best. The human mind cannot conceive what he cannot perceive. Since you cannot perceive this pure spirit state of existence, you can't conceive anything about it. That's why it behooved Yahweh to take on this shape and form, which is known as the word of sun, and appears in visions and revelations to explain it to you. And then to wipe out your excuse, he came into a physical body. Where the scripture says, we've seen and we've handled it. See? But the Holy Spirit, it's all the Holy Spirit. Even this is still the Holy Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit, this is the Holy Spirit. This is, you know, we got to look at Yahweh and live Yahshua. He's all in all. He's all of that. See? So there's no difference between the Holy Spirit and the law of the Spirit, the Spirit of law. When we talk about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is simply you recognizing that which is in you all along. Because, see, because people say, well, the Holy Spirit got to get in you. That is not true. Yeah. <laughs> That's just not true. Because Yahweh doesn't have to jump from one right. place to another, as he is universal. Matter is spirit materialized. So he doesn't have, oh, I got to get out of this and get over here. No, it doesn't work like that. But see, but the pattern is going to explain to you these plates and charts, going through these examples, is going to explain to you how the process works, which is why we do this. Okay? Now, back over here. This is, this is the model that the world looks at. Because right. they think that if you consciously say something, then it goes into your subconscious, and then somehow the subconscious appeals to the universal, which is going to bring it back around to your conscious. And it just doesn't work like that. But yet millions of millions actually, millions of people actually believe this, this model, which is the, which is the model 
by which prayer people have, and in all these different religions, when they make these prayers, they do these rituals and stuff, this is the model they, that they're, they're operating under, whether they realize it or not. See? Now, here in America, as I said, Dr. Kennedy went to California. There were people like, you know, uh, that had books out like Napoleon Hill, I remember him, W. Clement Stone, yeah, I believe it was another one. And they based their ideas on what we had put up here about Ernest Holmes. See, about, the, about the science of mind. And Dr. Kinley, when he came to California, he ran into you know, that philosophy, science of mind. And it just so happened, I think the guy, Ernest Holmes, who wrote the book, Science of Mind, died a year later after Dr. Kinley came to California. But that's where the world is in that. Now, who's that guy? He used to have the Crystal Cathedral, Robert Schuller. He was another proponent of this type of thing, you know? If you can think it, you can achieve it. A lot of these mega churches out there, they operate on the same way. If you can think it, you can achieve it, you know, you know, just, you know, have good thoughts and, you know, pray about it and bring the money down, you know. But that's how a lot of people think this thing works. And, we're, and, and this is the counterpoint that Dr. Kelly is making. See, he made a point about one, what the new psych, you know, what the new psychology is. Two, what the failure of it is. Now he's gonna, he's now he's gonna compare the exegetical analysis with what we just read about the new psychology. You see how he's doing this? Now? He's making a point, counterpoint, and this is the reason why Dr. Kelly. This right. is why we call him because right. Dr. Kelly a doctor. This is why he has a PhD. Dr. Henry Clifford Kelly went to Fish University. Uh, that's a, one of these historical black colleges, all right? And he gave a, a, an, an oral dissertation about what we're going through right now. He gave an oral dissertation to the faculty there at Fisk University, all right? In other words, he got up and explained, and th they said it took several hours. He got up and explained what we read about, what, what, one, what the new psychology was, then he went through what the failure was, then he went through comparative exegetical analysis, explained what spirit law was, and then used for his proof the hydrogen atom to explain this point. And after he got through, they asked him, they said, man, what university you graduated from? And he said, I'm a sixth grade dropout. And they said, well, not anymore. We're going to give you a degree. Because what you just explained, see, that's PhD level explanation. And they gave him a degree for that. Of him, this is the reason why he has one. This is no pun intended, but this is the heart. This is the heart of my doctrine. He said, I said, no, it's Yahshua the Messiah. Huh? That is Yahshua the Messiah. Yahshua the Messiah is Elohim, the archetype original pattern of the universe by which salvation is rendered by. I stand on that. But that's what Henry Clifford Kelly preached. This is, this, he wrote this. Somebody else said, Dr. Harris wanted to write this, and then Dr. Kelly. Kelly waved him off and said, that's all right. This is my baby. <laughs> and he did. Matter of fact, me and Kenny Wade, when we remember when we went to Nashville in 2001? We went to Fish University to try to find the paperwork. We talked to a guy. We talked to the dean of students there. If I remember his name, uh, Dr. George Kelly. That was his name. He was the dean of said, We went there, did we not, my dear? Yes, we did. Yeah. And uh, in fact, in fact, ironically, Fish University is right across the street from Meharry Medical. College, which is the college of Robert Harris. Right. Right? It's right across the street. Okay, but we went there, but the, because it was summer, it was still summer, because we were at the, the 2001 convention in Nashville. That was, a, that was the year itself. And so we decided to go to Fish University to try to get, find some paperwork, you know, because that's where he got the degree. And so the guy, he, he was very nice, very nice gentleman. And he said, give us a few days and we'll look and we'll see what we can find. And he, got, he called me up after, because we were there like a week, you know, and he called me up after a couple of days, and he explained to me, he said, well, he said, the paper that you're looking for, we think it may have been destroyed because it was stored in a, in a, in a, in a building that got overran by a flood and destroyed all the documents. And so that's why we couldn't, you know, but he was really nice about it as far as looking and trying to, you know, so that we could try to verify, you know, but he did get his PhD from Fisk University. But, uh, but yeah, 
that's and, and, and people and there are people that don't believe this section. Okay? And I say, well, if you don't believe this section, then you need to quit calling Jimmy Cookie Jimmy a doctor. Right. It's as simple as that. Because this is the reason why. Right. The very reason why he has a PhD, what we what we are reading about right now. Okay? And so now read the next uh, textbook. Read the next uh, paragraph. And as much as Elohim in this intermediate state is the true original incorporeal pattern and spirit law by which the invisible and visible parts of the universe or creation must be systematically formed and given life. He must possess both masculine and feminine generative organs or the space of the universe containing everything within his holy and within his spirit embodiment. Likewise, Elohim himself, the immaculate essence or substance, energy or life, and the immutable law intelligently manifesting himself or apparently transmuted in part into both the invisible and visible counterparts of the universe. Hence the universe in its totality, which expression includes every created object or thing, visible and invisible, animate and inanimate, known and unknown to be in existence, must derive from and abide within his great spirit embodiment. Hold it right there. Now that used to be a controversy years ago. It still may be in some parts. It is great spirit embodiment. See, because there are people, I'm talking about people under this teaching that tend to think that, well, Elohim is standing above the sun and the stars, looking down on them all, and not understanding that this creation is right, right. The creation abides within Elohim. And that's why you see here, up here, see, you have Moses. It's a panoramic vision of Elohim to Moses. He sees Elohim. Then he sees Elohim transform into this intangible tabernacle. Put it to you like this. He sees the word. Then he sees the definition of this word. Now he sees this word and look, it's a half man transmuting in part, not in totality, into every facet of the creation. Now, how did that come about? Come about. We have it right here. First, we have theosophy. See, which is that heart. We should right. see. This is the heart. Look at it. It's the heart. What we what we're doing is we if we was like if we took an apple and we cut it in half. Then you will see the inner workings of the apple. You see where the, where the peeling and the meat is and the core. You see, well, this is that part over there in that cloud. This is what's in that part. See, these attributes in a, in a set position, embellished or, in, or enveloped within the tenth attribute, which is the kingdom. Okay? Here, we see, we see Elohim. Matter of fact, I think I got it. When I have it. Yes, I think I have it right here. Okay, this is, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, this is a pamphlet. This is, a, this is probably one of the biggest pamphlets I did want to put out. This one right here. This is called Infallible biblical and scientific proof of how, when, where, and for what purpose the universe was created by Henry Clifford Kennedy, D.D., Ph.D. All right? Dr. Kennedy wrote this book. This book. I'm just going to read an excerpt from it. Also, I actually want to download it.
See, because the Passover in Egypt is a type and shadow of, uh, of what happened. Here. Right. That's why Dr. Kelly talks about the two exodus, see. Alright? Now, uh, this is this this is one little quote here. Revelations 13 and 8. Mm -hmm. And all that dwell upon the upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Okay, now. The Lamb slain from the foundation. See, the Lamb down here in Egypt right. represented the Lamb up here, slain from the foundation of the world. All right. Now I want you to go ahead and read that. The account which Moses gives us Elohim's command to slay the Paschal Lamb mm -hmm. in the beginning of the migration of the Israelites from Egypt, as recorded in Exodus 12, 1 through 6, is a confirmation of Revelations 13 and 8, mm -hmm. which John saw of Elohim as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Okay, now I'm going to pass over to here. Because we're on this plate here. See, this is Elohim. See, the lamb in Egypt pointed to this lamb slain from the foundation of the earth, of the world. Continue reading. Continue. And Elohim spoke, spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. I can read the box, though. Go to the next. The next page. Yeah, they already read that. Yeah, that's right. So, no, you gotta go up here. From here to the next page. Yeah. Yahweh Elohim spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt to instruct the Israelites to slay the Pascha lamb. Mm -hmm. The, the stig, stigium or stigium? Stigium. Stigium 
night of the 14th before the beginning of their migration from Egypt. John was made to see in his vision the events of the Passover in Egypt and the beginning of the migration. This is compared with Moses' vision in the cloud on top Mount Sinai where he saw the beginning of the path of the physical creation. See the beginning of the physical creation. Well, well, come over here just to show you picture. Here's Moses. He sees this, the beginning of the physical creature, which is Elohim. Right. Read. While in the presence of Elohim, Moses first heard the voice of Elohim and then saw in the vision Yahweh's super incorporeal form, which is Elohim, the original archetype pattern. It was from this form that Moses saw Elohim create the universe. This taking on of the super incorporeal form mm -hmm. from pure spirit. Now listen carefully. From pure spirit, because see, look here. This is him taking on shape and form from pure spirit. How do I know? Because look here. Look here. See, on the veils here. These veils look like clouds. He's coming out from behind. He's coming out of the cloud, so to speak, taking on shape and form. The cloud in this analogy represents the veil. Right. The veil of inscrutability, the veils of incomprehensibility. That's what we said about the abstract state. You can't, you can't perceive it. So now he's coming out of that state of inscrutability and incomprehensibility and making himself scrutable, making himself comprehensible by taking on shape and form. Keep reading. And then transforming in part into the creation mm -hmm. was Yahweh departing from the pure state mm -hmm. of invisibility to a lesser state of visibility mm -hmm. or the intermediate state. Correct. Thus it was a Passover from pure spirit mm -hmm. to revealed incorporeal visibility. Incorporeal visibility was a Passover. He's passing over from abstract into incorporeal visibility. And that's a death. That's the first death. That's the first Passover. Because he's coming into a lesser state. Coming through the veils. See, that's a pass. He's passing over from abstract now he's incorporated. Now he, you can see this in a vision of Revelation now. Whereas before, you couldn't see nothing. Right. You couldn't perceive anything. So him coming into that is that's the first Passover. Because that's a death. Read. Or being slain, which made John to understand that Yahshua was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. The slain before the foundation. People have been hanging of that day. You're looking for a principle. Mm -hmm. This is the salvation of everything. Your salvation, your salvation came about before anything else. Your salvation came before anything else. See? Keep reading. There's anything else too. As compared by the Passover feast and the lamb slain before the exodus out of Egypt. See, before the exodus. See, you gotta have an exodus right. before there's a genesis. Elohim made an exodus from pure spirit, then, there, then there's a genesis. There had to be an exodus of the Israelites first before there was a new beginning for them. Before Moses could come up here and see the genesis, they had to do an exodus first. And there had to be a sacrifice. There had to be a death. Why? Because it was a death of him. Right. Okay? It's a reflection of that. All right? Is there anything else there? All right, good it enough. It goes into the account. Okay, that's good enough. Yeah. That's good enough. All right. Now, this is the creation. When Elohim, when Yahweh took on shape and form here, Yahweh, pure spirit, went out of the created business or went back into his rest. And the sun did the work. And we, you read that the sun, in part, right. created this creature. What do you mean? It is this heart. This heart and this, they're both one and the same. Here, we got veils. The division between 
spirit and matter. Here's this heart. When it passes through the veil, in part, it creates this one hydrogen atom. And that's all I don't have to do. It wasn't like he waved his arms and, you know, and, and things started coming together, you know, da, da, da. no, he just transmuted in part into right. one hydrogen atom and told it, be fruitful and multiply. One became two, two became four, four became, and then you got molecules. Here you got gaseous state, these gases. And then, and then here, the, the division between, the division between the first and second heaven. First you have the gases first, then coming down here to the first heaven, you have this, what Dr. Kinley termed as, this great amalgamated conglomeration of a coring mass. Okay? But it started off with one hydrogen molecule. Right. You see my point? How do you think you came into this world? One cell, right? See? An ovum. That means this. It's an unfertilized egg. And then here you got a giant sperm coming in. And look, you know, I, I can't draw 60 million of them. But there's a whole bunch of them, right? And, 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 and just because you get there first, don't mean you're going to be the one that fits in there. Right. See? And then so you're going to have all these different, you know, all surrounding, you know, and crushing, crushing on the egg. And see, but when that one sperm gets in there, See, and then the tail breaks off. But what they've discovered recently that there's a flash of light mm -hmm. that happens with the ovum, all right? And see, and then now that ovum now, has, it's not an ovum anymore because it's fertilized. Now it becomes, yes, it becomes a zygote. But at one point, it's still one cell at the initial stage of fertilization. But then a process comes up. called mitosis, which is cell division. And then, and then one, one becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, eight becomes 16, and then trillions of cells later, here you are. But you started off as one cell. See, that's how the universe started off. That's one particle. Even the scientists will tell you that. I got my foot here. I got my book here. My science book here, yeah, I sure do. Uh, let's see here. Here we go. Got this pen. All right. <clears throat> right here. See this here? This is this is what they call the Big Bang Theory. And they said that if you would have traced the universe back to its origins, this is what they said. It would start off as one particle. This is in a science book. And then that one particle began to expand or multiply. And it goes through a rate of inflation. Molecules come together, become gases and solids and all. Then we got, you know, stars and galaxies, nebulas, etc. And then they say this, that a certain, this is what the scientists say based on their observation. They say, well, after a time, see, then you have what is called the big crunch, where everything will, will collapse, gravity will pull everything back in and everything will collapse back into that one original particle. Now that's what the scientists say, okay? And I agree, because you know why? Because they don't know who, what that part, what, what, that, what that atom is. Right. See, that 92nd atom, see it starts off with elephant. It starts off with elephant, and it ends with elephant, because he's the original hydrogen atom or the 92nd atom, as Dr. Kennedy classifies it, in this textbook. How are we doing on time? Because I know. 11.51. Okay. Thank you. Uh, oh, we got about, about 10 minutes? OK. See, I, I told you, see, the last time I did this, it took three class sessions to go through this in a real thorough way. I hope I can get at least some of it. I hope I answered your questions somewhat a little bit.
Because, see, this is what Dr. Kinley's talking about. Um, since we mentioned the hydrogen atom, um, turn to page uh, 92 and read the. Uh, don't just read. Page 92. I'm not 92, 52. Did I say 92? I'm sorry. Yeah, you did. 52. My, 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 I, I, I don't have my glasses on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know. I'm getting on the G-G. Oh, my gosh. This is terrible. Yeah, 52. I'm sorry. We're still in comparison to Mexico. The Apostle Paul said, For in him the Messiah dwelleth, all the fullness of the supernal nature of Yahweh in bodily form. Here we have the agreeable statements of the Apostle John and Paul on the structure of the Godhead. The practical scientific authority on the structure of atoms, a brief investigation of scientific data compiled on one, the, ato the atomic, two, the electronic, and three, the mo molecular. Discoveries will review, reveal that basically matter is composed of one, the proton, two, the neutron, and three, the electron. And all, and these three components part form one of these atoms, the, in order to show the manifestations of the threefold Godhead in these 91 threefold ultra microscopic particles of matter, our knowledge of the comparisons are as follows. Okay, come up here. Keep reading. The unity of the Spirit, uh -huh. Which is the Father, uh -huh. the Word, the Holy Spirit, uh -huh. the 91 atoms, mm -hmm. the proton, proton, the neutron, neutron the electron, electron. transmutation, mm -hmm. abstract, intermediate, concrete. Okay, so you see that? He's, he's trying to make it as simple as possible to see this, okay? Keep going quickly because we got The 92nd and last atomic element of matter mentioned herein is twofold and is composed of the electron, the proton, and these two components, parts, form the entire hydrogen atom. Mm -hmm. The two component parts of the hydrogen atom represents the invisible creation and the visible creation. Listen carefully, right. because it's two, it represents the invisible creation, which is here in the Holy Spirit, and the visible creation. Keep going. Both of which are embodied in Yahweh and are controlled with unerring accuracy by the universal spirit law in order to show and now I'm right there. here's the point I'm making Elohim standing on a page working with sapphire stone he is the original 92nd right. Right. see his, his incorporeal body that would be like a proton or not as a proton would be like here the electron would be like the page work with a sapphire stone both of them which is the same as this heart here is enveloped in the invisible third part, which is Yahweh. Okay, quickly read. Quickly. In order to show, um, lost my spot. In order to show an erring accuracy by the universal spirit law. Mm -hmm. In order to show the manifestation of the supernal nature in the 92nd and last ultra microscopic particle of matter. Our knowledge of the comparisons are as follow. Mm -hmm. And last ultra microscopic particle of matter, our knowledge of the comparisons are as follows. The 92nd atom, mm -hmm. the spirit law, the, spirit law the, invisible the invisible creation, the visible creation. The visible creation. The visible creation. We, we've done it many times because we talked about the three heavens. First heaven, second heaven, third heaven. See, what she just said, see, the, the, the spirit law, the invisible creation or angelic creation, and the physical creation, both of which is emanating from the spirit law. Quickly. The supernal nature, mm -hmm. the Father, Father the, Word, the Word, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. 
the 91 atoms, mm -hmm. abstract, abstract, intermediate, intermediate concrete. concrete. Exemplifications of the above comparisons are observed in the threefold structure of Noah's Ark, mm -hmm. the tabernacle of Moses, and the temple, and the migration of the Israelites, etc. See, because it's showing the same repetitions ark by pattern. Moses, Moses uh, rather Noah's Ark was a lower deck, middle deck, and upper deck. The tabernacle, court round about, holy place, most holy place. Solomon's temple, a porch, a sanctuary, and an oracle. The migratory pattern. Egypt, wilderness of Sinai, Canaan's land. He's just trying to make it as simple as, as, as he can here to show for the operation of spirit law. Quickly. It is also noteworthy that the Apostle Paul used parchments mm -hmm. to draw the divine pattern or tabernacle of Moses and to make spiritual comparative illustrations in his teaching. The best way to understand the illustration of the supernal nature compared to the elements of matter and transmutation are shown in an example. Carefully observe and remember this threefold arrangement. Understandable are shown as follows. Right. Go ahead. The most holy place, mm -hmm. the holy place, the court round about, mm -hmm. the Father, the Word, the Holy Spirit, the proton, the neutron, and the electron. Mm -hmm. The nucleus, I mean the nucleolus, the nucleus, and the cell body. Mm -hmm. If we accept the testimony of the divine and scientific authorities as the truth, we are then compelled to agree that the structure of the supernal nature and of the 91 atomic elements of matter are threefold. Likewise, we are compelled to agree that the structure of the universe and the 92nd hydrogen atomic element of matter is twofold mm -hmm. and embodied in the invisible third part of the supernal nature or Godhead. See, that's why I like to go here to this chart. Here's the angelic creation, that would be the proton of the hydrogen atom. Here's the physical creation, that would be like the electron mm -hmm. of the hydrogen atom both of which are enveloped in the invisible third part, which is Yahweh, or spirit law. See? Okay? Continue quickly, please. Whereas, it is apparently evident that each and every atomic element and particle of matter embodied in the total structure of the physical creation is derived from universal spirit. It's derived from universal spirit. Okay? So therefore, it's going to have to reflect that. See, she was talking about the atom and the cell and all, but see, that's we just talk about the structure. See, there's a function, just like in the tabernacle here. See, there's a structure in the tabernacle, but there was a priesthood in here that operated as a function. Just like in the atom, you have protons, neutrons, and electrons. But in the atom, you have forces, electromagnetic forces, gravitational forces, nuclear forces, both strong and weak. Why? Because that's like the high priest operating between the particles, just like the high priest here operating between the vessels. This is the same thing. And see, because matter is spirit materialized, then it has to take on the same structural pattern of the, of the archetype pattern, because that's the original pattern from which it's derived from. Okay, quickly read. In the material realm of nature, these 91 threefold atomic elements of matter, mm -hmm. systematically formed by universal spirit law, mm -hmm. apparently present su sufficient concrete evidence to support the existence of the threefold supernal nature. See, that, that's what Dr. Kidley used in his in this dissertation to get his PhD. This was the proof that he used the structure of the hydrogen atom. And no scientist can dispute that. Even hydrogen itself. See, when you look at the structure of hydrogen, see, you have hydrogen. Which is one, one proton, one electron. It can, it can split off into two isotopes. One is deuterium. 
which has one proton and one neutron. And it also can split off into tritium, which is one proton and two neutrons. So what you have is two manifestations of the one element. Why? Because we talked about the angelic and the physical creation. Here's the physical creation, here's the angelic creation. You have two manifestations of the one spirit. See? Taking the natural to understand the spirit. So quickly read. God has likewise the, the hydrogen atom, the 92nd and only twofold atomic element of matter, clearly manifests that the universe is composed of two distinctive parts, namely one, the invisible or incorporeal creation, and two, the visible or material creation. These are the two transmuted parts of the threefold supernal nature or Godhead. The apparent total absence of the third part in the twofold hydrogen atom as related to the threefold supernal nature or Godhead and the twofold universe also has a very important significance. It reveals that the invisible or corporal and the visible or material parts of the universe are embodied in universal spirit law, or the major invisible third part of the supernal nature or Godhead, wherein both are accurately and unerringly controlled by universal spirit law. Okay, now that's, that's, that's that in a nutshell. I mean, we don't have time to elaborate on uh, more, but I'll put this up. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Spirit versus science of mind. Basically, it, it, it goes down to like this. All right. Um, well, one, the law of the spirit is spiritual. Right. It's spiritual. Whereas science of mind is carnal. Okay. That's right. That's just off the bat. The law of the spirit is uh, is, is m. Immutable. See, that means it doesn't change. Whereas science of mind is changeable. See? The law of the spirit is, is immortal. That means it's not subject to death. Okay. Whereas science of mind is mortal. See? Law of the spirit is, uh, let's see, how can I put it? Uh, what was it? Let's see. Righteous. Yeah, that's the word. Right. Righteous. It's righteous. Whereas science of mind. They talk about morals. morals. Uh, we'll put this up here. Incorrupt. The law of the spirit is incorrupt, whereas science of mind. <laughs> You see, you, you just go down the list, okay? See, you just go down the list, you know, like, uh, uh, let's see, we, we deal with uh, proof. We deal with proof. Science is the law of the spirit. Whereas over here, yeah, you don't need much proof. You just have a good, a good opinion. You, 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 see, you see what I'm doing here? 
See, that's the difference, what we're talking about and what everybody else is talking about. See, see, the law of the Spirit, see, true prayer is when the will of man is harmonized with the will of Yahweh. Right, right. That's the thing. And see, and, and really, most people, when they do pray, they, they want something natural. Treat their husband or a wife, give me some money, a car, a house, give me a better job, you know, that kind of thing. And that's and, and all it gets what all of those things are temporal, right. <laughs> and they all subject to change. All of this is subject to change, for either better or for worse. And see, you can expand that all into human government, because if human government is run by carnal-minded people or human beings, then they're subject to change too. See, for better or for worse, just like we had to change the government, we had an election, we got a new president. For some people, the change was for better. But to some other people, the change was for worse. Right. It's a matter of perspective. See? And to be honest with you, none of these governments are true government. I mean, we gotta deal with it because we live here, but the true government of the universe is, is right. Yahshua the Messiah. Because he's the only true potentate, you know, that runs anything around him. And he does run it, both good and evil. Because people say, oh, the devil is doing all the I, I, I just have to listen to a tape by Dr. King where he's, and he just, he just updated all that. He said, look, he said, Moses didn't kill Pharaoh. He said, Yahweh killed Pharaoh. That's what he said. He said, Yahweh killed Pharaoh. Moses was just an instrument. Right. And then you think of the thing, the devil's doing this all right. The devil ain't doing nothing. It's Yahweh. Because Yahweh said, I, I form the light and create darkness. I do good and I do evil. Right. I, Yahweh, do all these things. See? So the devil will do what he has to do. It's Yahweh that's that's doing it. That's that's letting him do that. He's got just like here, he allowed Pharaoh to be a worthy adversary. See, he allowed Pharaoh to be a worthy adversary. It's just so he can show his power. And look, that has not changed. Right. See, it has to appear that way. Oh, the devil doing this. He's got to allow this just so Yahweh can show his power. That he's the one running everything, and he is the one who, who will overcome all of this. See, the thing about it with you, you have to be steadfast in him and have faith in him. And faith based on what? Based on somebody's opinion? No, based on the evidence that we're showing you. See, based on the evidence that what he is, he himself is the evidence. To show for it, look, his, we said this. That there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Spirit. These three are one. The Spirit, the water, the blood point to the one. And here you are walking around. Right. You're the biggest evidence that there is a creator. You're the biggest evidence that spirit of law is in existence. But see, but you don't want to look at yourself, and, you know, but you don't want to say, you know, well. Anyway, we're out of time, aren't we? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> but this is a subject that really, like I can say, it, the last, it took three sessions, really. I'm talking about as far as to really get into right. the nuts and bolts, and you know, which we tried to do a little bit today, you know, to answer your question. I hope it gave you some, yeah. a, a bit of a set. Yeah, that, this is the heart of what we believe in. You know, I mean, we go through all these correlations and stuff like that, but this is, Dr. Kennedy said, this is, this is the heart of the doctrine. It really is. Everything else points to that to show forth that he himself is the true archetype pattern of the universe. And look, that is the resurrected Yahweh on the side. That is Yahweh manifested in shape and form. And he did that. That was a death. That was a sacrifice. All right? And that sacrifice was a sacrifice that set up everything. Set up the creation. Sets up everything. That's the way Dr. Kennedy put it. Some people may disagree with that, but I'll stick with Dr. Kennedy on this because he was an eyewitness and an apostle. And his record is true, not because it sounded good or it's my opinion, no, because he laid out the proof. He laid out the proof and the evidence for it. Now, whether or not you accept it or not, that's up to you. And that is your choice. Some people don't believe in that. But that's another lecture, okay? <laughs> but at this time, we'll, we'll end it and conclude it. I hope you all edified, and yeah, I, I hope that answers your question somewhat. I hope, like I say, it's a lot more. But take the time and look at these things. 
Take the time to peruse the, the evidence, the scriptures, this path, these charts are your friend. Engage them. Why? Because the more you engage these charts, the more they will engage you. And believe me, they will teach you things that you didn't think were on these charts. Okay? Thank you for your time and your patience. Uh, in closing, be safe, be healthy, and uh, but most, of, but most of all, be Yahshua Messiah, who truly is our only hope for us. Hallelujah. Yeah, I think he died a few years ago. Yeah, he was uh, doing experiments with LSD and stuff. To, you know, if he would have gone through the stuff we just got through today, next general of the houses, that would have blown his mind, you know, to find out where all this stuff come from, where you come from, you know? Yeah, and as I was sitting there listening and just reflecting on things that when I was growing up, how people would you know, go around, uh, trying to explain the mind, you know? This physical thing. But anyway, uh, this booklet, the charts, okay, uh, we started this book and all it had was the 40 plates. Later on, we expanded and put the seven basic charts in there. You get a couple of extra ones in there too. But uh, we're going to call it the chart book, okay? Now, when you call, you get, give me a call, I'll give you my number. It's area code 626. 678-4938. Uh, leave a message if I don't uh, answer. Leave a message and put your zip code down because we will be sending these things out uh, via uh, UPS. It's cheaper. Cheaper than the post office. All right? And there, each booklet is 77 what? Dollars. $77 each. Okay? When you send your money, we go order it same time, okay, we don't like to uh, uh, order a bunch of books and then have, you know, that's kind of expensive for us, okay, so as soon as you give your check, you can send it to us, we'll go and have the book made, bound, and we'll ship it out to you. Uh, Dennis, if you're watching, your book will be with, uh, with Will when he goes down there to uh, South Carolina in the box, okay? All right, let's all stand and be dismissed. Now to him that is able to keep you from falling, present your fault to his presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, to Yahshua, Sire, our sovereign, without glory, majesty, dominion, and power, but for all time, now and ever, let's all say, Amen. Amen.